Good morning. I'm proud and excited to introduce our next speaker, who is the first member of the press to ever speak at Communicating for Safety, NBC News correspondent Tom Costello. Tom reports daily for the Today Show, NBC Nightly News, MSNBC, and CNBC. His assigned beats include aviation, which he's been covering for 10 years, as well as transportation, NASA, regulatory, and consumer-related issues. He has received multiple Emmys for his work. The late NBC Washington Bureau Chief Tim Russert brought Tom to the DC Bureau in 2005. Prior to that, Tom worked at CNBC Business News where he served as the NASDAQ correspondent and was on duty in Manhattan on 9-11. For over a decade now, NACA has worked closely with Tom and his producer, Jay Blackman. They strive to be fair and to be accurate above all else. They call NACA regularly to discuss stories and ask questions whether or not we'll be included in the final story. In fact, just a couple weeks ago, uh, Director of Communications Doug Church and myself talked with Tom, who was calling to check in about uh, some facts about air traffic controller staffing in the U.S. to make sure he had everything accurate for a story that ran later that week on Today Show. In an era of diminishing media resources devoted solely to aviation or any particular issue, Tom stands out for his expertise. He is one of the few reporters who really does understand air traffic. During, the coverage, during his coverage of the Chicago Center outage in September last year, he was one of the few correspondents who knew the differences in types of air traffic facilities and was able to explain that on air in a way the flying public understood. He works to be knowledgeable about aviation and air traffic control despite the many other topics you heard he has to report on. He is asked to wear many hats and he wears all of them with skill and with professionalism. He holds a special place at NACA because he was the very first national correspondent to cover NACA's Archie League Medal of Safety Awards. His story ran on NBC Nightly News on May 16, 2005, the day of NACA's first awards banquet that year. It was one of the finest stories about the air traffic control profession that we have seen in the past 10 years. And he also did another story that ran in 2012 about our Archie League Award winners that aired on the Today Show. So, it is my honor to introduce to the CFS stage for the first time ever, Tom Costello. Thank you. That was nice of you. Thank you so much. Good morning. I've got to put my hot tea down here somewhere because I've, I'm nursing a sore throat. Uh, it is great to see all of you so early in Las Vegas. In fact, do you mind if I take a selfie here because I got to prove to my boss this really wasn't a boondoggle. So everybody just, hang on a second here. Everybody just give me a big, a big smile. One more time. Okay, now, now wave. Everybody wave. Okay, I got you. <laughs> Early in Las Vegas. That's a contradiction, I think. Um, but thank you. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for allowing me to escape our endless winter out on the East Coast, uh, I hate to tell you this, uh, D.C. getting even more wintry weather today. My flight has already canceled returning, and Boston, more snow Thursday. So, you know, there are worse places you could be stuck for a couple of days, I guess. Um, but, uh, you know, honestly, this could have been the national uh, gathering of bug collectors. Anything to get me out of that winter would have been welcome. Uh, but for me, the good news is I don't cover entomology. I cover what you do for a living. Uh, I cover aviation, as Sarah mentioned, uh, for the Today Show, for NBC Nightly News, and because NBC owns half of your cable channel lineup, you'll see me on MSNBC and CNBC and the Golf Channel and wherever they can stick me. If you ask a network correspondent, what is the best beat to have? Many of them, or most of them, would probably say this one, the one I have, aviation. Aviation is important because it is dynamic and because it is fast-paced and is something every American can relate to. Nearly everyone flies, of course, for business or for vacations or for family affairs. And so it touches all of us very, in a very real way. We as a nation take almost a billion commercial passenger trips each year, 30,000 commercial flights each day, and every time a plane take off, takes off and lands safely, it reminds us all what we do well in this country. We as a nation pioneered air travel. 
This is the country that is home to Boeing and McDonnell Douglas and TWA and Pan Am and Piedmont and Eastern and Western and the list goes on. We built the most sophisticated and busiest air traffic system in the world and we built the ATC system of course to support it. From the first air, air control tower back in Cleveland in 1930 to the first in route centers to the development of radar to the explosion of commercial air traffic in the 60s and 70s to the PATCO strike that I remember well because one of my best friends growing up, her father was one of the PATCO, uh, PATCO strikers, I should say, who was laid off, never came back to the job, and to the rollout of ADSB and Next Gen Today. What you do every day is cutting edge America. You do it with precision and you do it with excellence day after day. And you are damn serious, we know, about your commitment to safety. Safety is in your DNA. We know it, we get it. What makes your jobs so interesting to all of us is aside from the fact that you speak at triple the pace of a normal American and you rattle off numbers and g'days faster than a Texas auctioneer, what makes your job fascinating is that the colleagues you're honoring today and yesterday really represent what all of you do every single day. And you think nothing of the fact that you catch a pilot making a mistake that might have proven catastrophic had you not, had, have you not helped him catch the course, altitude, or frequency correction. So we at NBC News do an awful lot of stories about what you do every single day and a lot of reporting about this field that you all are in, aviation. And as you know, the last 12 months have been a particularly busy stretch for all of us in this field. I brought along a video to remind us all of really what kind of a year we've had, both domestically but also overseas. Still no word what went wrong. No word on the lives of the 239 souls on board. At the Australian Maritime Command Center, they're coordinating an international effort growing more complicated by the day, still focused on a grid 1,500 miles southwest of Perth. Um, it nonetheless is a big area when you're looking out the window and trying to see something by eye. In the air on Friday, three P-3 aircraft from Australia and New Zealand, an American P-8 subhunter, and a C-130 dropping buoy markers that transmit data on ocean currents. The search zone is massive. It is about the size, we're told, of Alaska. And so far, they haven't found a single piece of debris that they know came from this plane. Engineers at Inmarsat examining those faint pings transmitted by Flight 370 compared them with data from other 777s flying at the same time. Then, with some advanced math and assumptions about speed and altitude, they came up with two flight paths into the Indian Ocean. For the first time, we're hearing the voice from the cockpit as Flight 370 communicated with Malaysian controllers. Family members have also heard the recordings. We don't know if it's Captain Zahari Shah or First Officer Hamid Farik, but all of the conversations appear routine. The last transmission at 1.19 a.m. is believed to be from Captain Shaw. Malaysian 370. Malaysian 370. Contact Hachimin 120.9. Good night, Malaysian 370. At 1.21 a.m., the plane disappeared from radar, but not until 1.38 a.m. did Vietnamese controllers tell Malaysia the plane was missing. Then another four hours before the Malaysian Search and Rescue Center was activated. Far too long, say safety experts who insist searchers would have been launched far sooner in the U.S. I think when you dissect that four-hour delay, that could be the difference of finding this airplane and not finding this airplane. Is that a plane has crashed somewhere near the Ukraine-Russia border. We are being told this is a Malaysia air flight that started out in Amsterdam, on its way to Kuala Lumpur. Well, we are told that this is Malaysia Flight 1717, as you said, Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur, and it was reportedly a Boeing 777.
Amateur video from eastern Ukraine captured the thick black smoke billowing from the plane's wreckage. On the ground, the intense fire left a scorched landscape. But the distinctive markings left little doubt this was a Malaysia Airlines Boeing 777. This photo shows the actual plane just after Flight 17 took off from Amsterdam Schiphol Airport at 12.30 p.m. European time bound for Kuala Lumpur. Nearly three hours later, Ukrainian air traffic controllers lost contact with the plane. The Ukrainian government quickly said the plane had been hit by a surface-to-air missile at 33,000 feet. At the time, the plane was over contested territory in eastern Ukraine, only 31 miles from the Russian border. A lot of people are asking this morning, why was a commercial airliner flying over this area at all? NBC's Tom Costello covers aviation for us. He's been looking into that part of the story. Tom, good morning. Hi, Savannah. Good morning. The rebels had warned Ukrainian military planes not to fly over rebel-held territory, but there was no warning against civilian passenger planes flying through Ukrainian airspace. Still, U.S. airlines were warned in April by the FAA to avoid the region following the Russian invasion of Crimea. Now, the FAA is expanding that order. For several hours today, a drama unfolded in the skies all the way down the eastern seaboard, out over the ocean, across Cuba, before ending in Jamaica. As a privately owned plane, a turboprop aircraft remained on a southern heading with a veteran pilot at the controls who was unresponsive. Radar systems lit up along the flight route. Fighter jets were scrambled. They reported back they could see the pilot slumped over, and it became then a matter of waiting for it to run out of fuel and fall from the sky. It was 8.25 a.m. when this seven-seat business passenger plane left Rochester, New York, headed for Naples, Florida. On board, Larry Glazer, a Rochester real estate developer, and his wife, Jane. They're playing a brand new 2014 Sakata TBM 900. But when he contacted Atlantic controllers, he reported a problem on board. We uh, have an indication it's not correct to the plane. Glazer requested permission to descend from 28,000 feet to 18,000 feet, but once he leveled off at 25,000, controllers were unable to raise him. TBM. CBM 0 Kilo November, descend and maintain flight level C00. Zero zero. Flying in a straight line south. F 15 fighter pilots intercepted the plane off the east coast. The windows frosted, the pilot slumped over. The leading theory somehow the cabin lost pressure, incapacitating the glazers. In a matter of minutes, you start to feel the effects of hypoxia, but in a matter of 10, 15, 20 minutes, then you will succumb. A United Airlines flight attendant remains hospitalized tonight in critical condition, recovering from injuries she suffered when her aircraft hit unexpected and severe turbulence in flight last night. Before the emergency aircraft is on a three mile final, next aircraft will end. It was a violent, terrifying end to a routine flight. In just seconds, five people were injured, including a flight attendant with a serious head injury. This bleeding pretty badly, and they can't. Get it to stop, so they're requesting a medical attention at the gate. It happened at 34,000 feet over Montana. United Flight 1676 was nearing the end of its flight from Denver to Billings when, without warning, the plane began to shake. Then a sudden drop to the right. Amid screaming, flight attendants and passengers were thrown about the cabin. A baby being held by its parents was thrown over several rows of seats, landing safely on another passenger's lap. All of a sudden, they're screaming that they can't find their baby, and, and she had flown across the aisle. There was wallets everywhere, and eyeglasses, and iPads, and everything had just, it looked like a tornado had come through there. NBC's Tom Costello covers aviation for us and is with us this morning. Hey, Tom, good morning. Hi, Hoda. Yeah, this happened very quickly. Just as this JetBlue Airbus with 147 people on board was on its initial climb out on takeoff, a dramatic and terrifying mid air emergency. It doesn't get much scarier than this smoke filling an aircraft and terrified passengers grabbing for oxygen masks. JetBlue Flight 1416 had just taken off from Long Beach, California, headed to Austin, when suddenly passengers reported hearing an explosion. The number two engine on the right side was on fire. Soon, smoke began bleeding into the aircraft. The pilot quickly interrupted radio traffic to tell controllers he was making an emergency landing. With smoke filling the cabin and babies screaming, many passengers feared the worst. You can't see the person next to you, and you're inhaling smoke. Um, 
and the oxygen masks are not deploying, um, you know, we all thought there was a, a, a major problem. Air travel across this country was disrupted by what appears to be sabotage at an FAA facility that just happens to handle the critical routing in the airspace above and around Chicago O'Hare. All of the runways completely empty at this point. A day of endless lines and a massive backup. At both airports, thousands of flights canceled or delayed. They stopped all their departures here for some reason. We don't know what's going on out there. And tens of thousands of travelers going nowhere fast. I'm going to have an extremely upset wife, and I don't know how to deal with that just yet. It started at 5.40 a.m. Central Time with a fire in the basement of Chicago Center, a critical air traffic control facility that handles high-altitude traffic through the region. Inside, firefighters found a 36-year-old contract employee who police say had stabbed himself after sabotaging critical communication systems and setting multiple fires. There are no indications of terrorists. There is no reason to believe that anyone else is involved at this time. With Chicago Center out of action, both O'Hare and Midway airports stopped all traffic. So the issue is the uh, center out of Chicago lost all their frequencies. Within minutes, the airspace above and around Chicago emptied out, an ominous looking gap as neighboring centers rerouted traffic. Eventually, some flights were allowed to leave if they flew low, below 10,000 feet. 10,000 feet is not very efficient for an airplane. Finally, we seem to be getting altitude now. But within hours, they were feeling the impact nationwide. Tonight, that critical air traffic control system is still not at 100%. In fact, we're told that the damage to that system may be quite extensive. It could take days, perhaps even weeks, to get it fully operational again. Law enforcement sources say the suspect appears to have had a grudge against his employer, we don't know why. In court today, 36 year old contract employee Brian Howard charged with sabotaging Chicago Center, critical for high altitude flights. 20 of 29 computer racks destroyed. The damage is, is, is devastating. It is it cut off all communication, all radar feeds, uh, and all data processing. Now, the FAA chief has ordered a review of security and contingency plans nationwide. If one suspect can do this much damage, are all of your facilities this vulnerable? All of the facilities um, have appropriate levels of security, and we have actually increased the security um, at our facilities. With Chicago Center out, four other regional control centers are handling the traffic. Minneapolis, Kansas City, Cleveland, and Indianapolis centers are channeling arrivals. Departures are going through those same centers, though northern departures are now handled by Milwaukee radar approach. Controllers say managing the air traffic without Chicago Center has posed the greatest challenge since 9-11. The FBI is intensifying its search for the person or persons behind a series of threatening tweets aimed at commercial planes in the U.S., many of them bomb threats made in the name of ISIS. The radio traffic between the tower and pilots, anything but usual. This FBI just uh, doing a check, uh, house conditions on board, flight deck secure over. The flight deck is secure. Uh, passengers are uh, pretty well behaved. Um, starting to get a little bit antsy. It's happened nearly two dozen times over the past two weeks. Bomb threats posted on Twitter by someone claiming to represent ISIS. On January 17th, Delta Flight 1803, Atlanta to Raleigh. And there were dogs sniffing us as we were coming on and off the plane. Yeah, it was a little crazy. On Sunday, JetBlue 1006, Long Beach to Seattle. Then Delta 4741, Phoenix to Seattle. Then Delta 1061, Los Angeles to Orlando, diverted to Dallas after someone tweeted, We are ISIS, we are here. On board, Sarah Chovnik, who saw the tweet while in the air. So to see that and to see someone say, you know, we are ISIS, we are here, we're on the plane, I mean, that was absolutely terrifying because you don't really know what you're looking for. You don't know if someone looks suspicious or not. Law enforcement sources say it appears to be the work of pranksters and copycats, not terrorists. The FAA is investigating a series of close calls between passenger planes and unmanned drones flying very high near some very big airports. It's happened in some of the nation's busiest airspace. Sunday afternoon, a Southwest Boeing 737 was on final approach at LAX when the pilot told controllers they just had a close call, not near the ground, but at 4,000 feet. The, uh, one of those uh, radio control helicopter things that went right over the top of us at 4,000. Over the top of you at 4,000, roger that. One yeah, of those uh, remotely piloted fields. Gotcha, the drone. Yeah, little bitty one was red in color. A day earlier, Saturday in Chicago, controllers warned pilots that a drone had been spotted at 3,500 feet.
American 190, use caution, uh, uh, Jerome was reported on the runway 27 right center line. I'm not picking up anything on radar. A few hours later in Dallas, a private plane reported a drone at roughly 1,300 feet. And in Atlanta Sunday, another drone flying very high at 8,500 feet. In each case, the drones were well above the FAA limit of 400 feet. The concern? A collision with a plane could crack a cockpit window or seriously damage an engine. The thing that uh, we have to avoid is any opportunity for aircraft to come into contact with one another because that is an extremely dangerous situation for everyone involved. Thankfully, not all of the aviation news we cover is that serious. You know, often when you're on a plane, you see those videos that tell you to buckle your seatbelt. And most and everybody do, ignores and them. Everyone, or talks through it or whatever. Well, well Virgin, it's not the first time you've heard it, you know. Virgin America has decided that they were going to make sure that you took notice. So take a look at their new in-flight video. I got some safety tips that you got to know. And trust me, it's something that you want to hear. So honey, sip your I often, you know, we love those videos, but I wonder, does anybody hear the message about what do you do, uh, you know, if, you, if the seatbelt sign comes on? I'm not sure anybody's paying attention. Um, AOPA Pilot Magazine uh, called what you did at Chicago Center ATC at its finest. ATC Zero got all of our attention. Forty planes on IFR were over that area when the outage began. A 91,000 square mile gaping hole in the network. And the radar images, as we showed on NBC Nightly News and the Today Show, were really astonishing. And even after they evacuated the center, those controllers were using their personal cell phones to text and call their colleagues at other facilities to let them know what the problem was. And then dozens of controllers getting in their cars and driving to other facilities to help uh, with the load. Uh, Jim Hall from Chicago TRACON said, everyone stepped up. We did whatever needed to be done. And ladies and gentlemen, that is why the country is proud of what you do and fascinated with the work you do. When bad stuff happens, you don't flinch, you get it done. And you make sure that our wives and our husbands and our parents and our siblings and our children get home safely. So thank you all and well done. I thought I'd offer a couple of words about how we decide on what stories we're going to cover and um, what rises to the top of the news agenda on any particular day. And then if you'd like, uh, we have uh, some time for some Q&A afterwards. I'd be lying if I didn't admit that social media right now is, is rewriting the news agenda almost every day. And it's not just celebrity or flight attendant meltdowns and pilots getting locked in the lab. Um, if there is a serious incident these days, as you saw in our video clips, there is always video, whether it's severe turbulence or a bomb threat or an emergency landing. And candidly, those moments uh, that quickly go viral on the Internet, that then grabs our attention and that can very often drive the news agenda. So an incident that may not have really gotten much attention at all a few years ago uh, today might end up being the lead on the evening newscast because news is very often a reflection of what the national dialogue is not on any given day but now it's any given hour it is literally that quick so our challenge my challenge is to do that story to report on the incident responsibly and without exaggeration knowledge and facts are the best answer to fear and to hysteria and and i find that i spend a tremendous amount of time uh, reiterating to our own people in our newsroom and then doing it on the air that air emergency landings are a, a very common occurrence. In fact, almost daily, and thankfully they almost always end well. But reminding viewers that flying is still by far the safest mode of transportation is part, I think, part of the responsibility of doing this job. We also, though, have a responsibility in the media to 
keep government, to keep airlines, and to keep the system honest and transparent. To tell the facts as they are so that we can all learn from mistakes and enjoy the benefits of a vastly improved safety culture, which we have, not just on air traffic control issues, and not just on aviation issues, but on railroad issues, on automobile issues. The more transparency, the more that we're open and honest about the issues, the better the system. Case in point, the Colgan air crash in Buffalo, New York, which I covered, resulted in far-reaching changes in what this country and what Congress uh, expects from regional airlines. Uh, I covered the Asiana crash in San Francisco, and out of that incident, a very big international discussion now on pilots' over-reliance, of course, on automation and the need to get back to basic piloting skills. Uh, in my first year of reporting, uh, I covered the crash of United 232 in Sioux City back in 1989 and United 585 in Colorado Springs in 1991. Every incident and every tragedy results in findings that drive, of course, new safety initiatives and requirements, and we've all seen the benefits and we all enjoy the benefits. So these stories uh, very often become part of a national news agenda and can very often become part of the national discussion, and they very much drive change. They apply pressure and they apply change. But something else can grab our attention and make for an interesting news story on any given day. And it's the chance to take the viewers behind the scenes, to, to pull back the curtain a bit and demystify the process, from the tower to TRACON to the baggage system to TSA. The behind the scenes moments help the audience understand how all the pieces can come together. We've done that at JFK, at ORD, at Atlanta, at IAD, DCA, Boston, DFW, MIA, you name it. We're always grateful to have the chance to show people at home how the system works and the next-gen changes that are coming to an airport near you. Just on Sunday, I flew with an American Airlines MD-80, the last passenger plane for that particular MD-80 from Baltimore to Dallas. And then, by the way, a plane that it had had carried four million people in its lifetime, the last passenger plane. And then on Monday, we got up early and took that plane with an American Airlines crew from DFW to the Boneyard in New Mexico. Um, and that is where it will spend the rest of its days. And spread out there on the desert floor in Roswell, New Mexico, are the carcasses of, of hundreds of planes. MD-80s and 75s and 76s and 747s, even Elvis's jet is sitting there um, on the desert. We've all seen these pictures and these images on TV and in magazines or what have you, but when you see it up close, it's really an inglorious end to these icons of the jet age. And it's really moving, I think, for anybody who um, cares about aviation. So we'll tell that story uh, in the coming weeks on NBC News, and we'll take viewers to some place that they wouldn't get to go otherwise. So it's all about combining the news with interesting stories, compelling moments, and bringing the audience closer to what it is that touches their lives every single day, aviation. And for us, just like for you, it is 24-7 and it's 365. So thank you all for inviting me here today. Thank you for the job you do, and I'm more than happy to uh, answer any questions that you may have. Do a little Q&A. Well, uh, nothing's off the table. Thank you very much. Yeah, any questions? So somebody, while, while you're walking up to the, uh, to the microphone, um, I get asked every single day, what are you really hearing about Malaysia 370, right? Um, because we talk to the Australian Transportation Safety Board regularly and we talk to the folks in Malaysia regularly. Um, they say now, I just got an email update this morning, they say now that they've, they've now scanned roughly 40% of the underwater search area and they think that they're going to have the entire area scanned by the end of May. That seems like a tall order to me, but they still believe, based on the Inmarsat data, that the plane is likely somewhere resting there uh, in the southern Indian Ocean. Um, you know, the conversation I've had with 777 pilots regularly is, could that plane, without a pilot, if everybody's incapacitated, we don't know, but if that's the assumption, could that plane have done a Sully Sullenberger and, and quite literally uh, come in and, and landed intact uh, and, and then sunk intact? Is that why we don't have any debris so many months uh, later, a year later? Um, 
No answers to that. Yes, go ahead. Uh, we saw some great clips um, in your, uh, your newsreel, and it seems like you're doing fantastic work reporting on uh, aviation issues. But I would say that um, most news reports about aviation are bad at best, and there's significant room for improvement. What do you think that the uh, news industry in general needs to do or could do to best improve aviation news coverage? Thank you. Yeah, I think you're right, um, and I think some of it has, first of all, you know, I, you have to kind of narrow down who in the news business you're talking about, right? Because we have local newspapers, we have local television, we have regional newspapers, you have national television, national newspapers. Um, I think generally, um, having covered this full time for 10 years, and I may be biased, but I think generally the national networks do a pretty good job of trying to tell the story accurately, and I think the national newspapers do a pretty good job. Um, you've got people who cover this full time. That's our jobs and my competitors at, at the other networks and also at, the, uh, at USA Today and the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Chicago Trip, whatever. Um, this is what we do. So we spend our days getting to know people like Paul and uh, getting to know Michael Huerta at the FAA and having the expertise that we can call and get answers and, and make sure that we understand the, uh, the story and the facts as best as we can. Um, so. Is there room for improvement on our level? I would, I would say absolutely, and I'm always uh, looking for people to call me up and say, you know, you could have been a little more precise on this point. You might want to tweak your language here. I call people like Paul and others uh, regularly and say, what is the exact language I should use on this right here? Um, unfortunately, if you're at a local TV station or a local paper, you don't necessarily have access to Paul or to Michael Huerta or to the experts that we have on our list of analysts that we use regularly at NBC News. Um, so all I can say is it's, you know, I think it's incumbent upon us as journalists to educate ourselves regularly, to reach out to the people who are the experts and to try to understand the story as best we can. And, you know, I will tell you that we do it with an open heart um, and we are doing our damnedest to be fair and accurate every day. It's, it's, it's hard to see uh, everybody back here, but uh, sure. the gentleman standing there at the microphone. Yeah, I'm wondering if there are any stories that, um, if you weren't constrained by a two or three minute block, that you would like to go back and re-report or expand on and correlate to that, if there are stories that you think just aren't being covered very well right now. Yes. NBC or other <laughs> agents. I always want more time. Absolutely. I'm fighting with my producers every single day. You know, I just need 10 more seconds. So I can have, hear more from Paul. Ten more seconds. Um, you know, I think it's a constant uh, battle that, you know, certainly uh, in television news at the network level that we face every day, and that is that we have a limited amount of time to tell the story. That's the reality of the business we're in. Um, and that's not going to change. You know, if, if you wanted 30 minutes to tell a story, I got to go work for 60 minutes. But if I'm going to do it for the number one evening newscast in America, then I'm going to have two minutes or so. So you get to a point where you are trying to synthesize your words and, and use the best descriptive language every day um, to drive home the story and educate the audience. You know, in my view, the audience, I, I'm always thinking, who's my audience? Because my audience, while it may be you, we hope you're watching, you guys know too much about the system. You don't need me to explain it to you. My audience is, I always think, it's somebody who is interested and engaged in their world Otherwise, they wouldn't be watching us, right? They'd be watching reruns of Happy Days or something. So they care about the world. They want to know what's going on. And, but they don't have time to become an expert in everything. So our job is to um, accept that this is somebody who's coming to the table with some degree of knowledge. And our job is to help them understand this issue even better. Um, make it easy to understand. Don't dumb it down, but make it easy to understand and accessible so that the average person watching can can get it. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Um, as, as you are, we are federal employees. Uh, we, all, <clears throat> we all love our profession, but I think what you would find is all of us in this room uh, love our country and love being a federal employee. One of the downsides of being a federal employee is we're part of the political process, and the media in general loves showing stories about lazy government employees that aren't doing their job. It's um, very easy to find individual circumstances that make a great news story. 
but it's very rare that you will see the media reaching out to say, look at the wonderful job these federal employees are doing for us. For, for example, what happened with Chicago and what those controllers did on the fly and just did it. Why? Because we love our profession and we love our country. And when we get into the budget seasons or whenever the news media wants to do stories about federal employees, it would be really great to once in a while see what a wonderful job federal employees do for their country. Just a comment. So you heard me talking about how we like to pull back the curtain. We like to go to the tower. We like to go to the TRADECOM. We like to show the country what it is that you do every day and how while you're celebrating heroes at this particular conference, the truth is all of you do this routinely every single day. I agree with you. Those are the stories that, you know, it doesn't have to be a breaking news story to get on the air. It can be a fascinating look behind the curtain. And I'm always looking for stories like that. We've done many of them, and we will continue to do many of them as well. Um, why do some stories get attention uh, of the, you know, the sleeping controller on the job? Because you're not supposed to sleep on the job. We don't do a story that 99% of the controllers were awake today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes? So in the era of social media and it dictating the news, what can we do to... I forgot to tweet. Ah, oh, shoot. <laughs> I forgot. I was supposed to tweet out that I'm coming here today. Ah, oh, shoot. Well, let's do it all again. I'm going to rewind. <laughs> And I'll tweet out. I'm sorry. What? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, the question is, can we use that effectively to change our image of federal employees? Does that draw attention to us if we get the media involved in good stories? Um, I don't think it's necessarily uh, a tweet will do it. I, I, listen, I think that this, this media landscape is changing so quickly um, that if you embrace it and you uh, take full advantage of it, whether it's, uh, you know, I was watching yesterday, I was watching the, uh, the ATC family feud on being web streamed. I thought it was fantastic. Um, but, you know, taking full advantage of the media to get the message out of who you are and what you represent and the jobs you do, um, I think can never hurts. Um, be careful with tweets because you can get in a lot of trouble with tweets. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for One having more me. Round of applause for Tom Fox. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.